Hi, once again. And once again, thank you, Genexis, for this kind invitation to come and talk to you. I've been here for quite some time. And I'm glad I'm, I was invited now and not 10 years ago. Because over the years, I've talked about AI, technology, neuronal interface uh, progress, machines, and so on. And thanks to participants, you're probably hungry. I cannot give you a sandwich, but I will try to give you food for thought. So one warning, it says here, oh, I don't see, I don't have a screen. Can you help me here? It says that I will talk about AI, blockchain, and virtual reality. And I'm not going to talk about that. I just mentioned it for two reasons. One, as you will see, this has a lot with what I'm going to say, but I will not talk specifically about these three things. And this was what brought you here, so I'm happy it was mentioned. Well, let me start with a few videos that I'm sure you've seen before. The videos tell you what is inside the atom, and it shows more than what you can imagine. Then there's another very simple video. I would like you to look at the circles. The circles represent a magnitude that comes smaller and smaller. Every time we change circles, it's 10 times smaller. So let us start. The human being that you see, then flowers, a cup of coffee or mate. And that's where it starts. And we will go in and in and in, zooming in, zooming in, to see the many things we have inside. The ant, hair. We keep on zooming in, roses, chromosome, the virus we know, VIH, ADN, uh, DNA, sorry, uh, water molecule, and we keep on zooming in. How far can we go? On and on and on, uranium nucleus, and we keep on going inside. These are the quarks, part of the atom. Neutrine, high energy, and on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And that tiny, tiny, tiny thing is the smallest thing we can reach. And what's wonderful about this? Inside each atom in our body, we have a whole universe. If I bring an atom out and then get a pin, a tiny pin, I will have to increase that to the size of the Earth and do that 50 times to get to the smallest ever thing. This is amazing. Likewise, I could go in the opposite direction. Let me start with the moon, millions of times bigger than the human being, and we'll see about the other celestial bodies. Mercury, Mars, Venus. You can read. I don't know why I'm reading that. It's funny. We need to do that. Neptune, Saturn. Look at the size of the moon and the Earth compared to Jupiter. But Jupiter vis-a-vis -vis the sun, the, the Earth is a dot, but the sun is nothing. Compared to Sirius, Pollux, that's an orange giant, a red giant. Our sun will become one of these stars in the future and life on Earth will disappear. And on we go. Look at the super blue. It's a giant, but it's small compared to the other stars out there in the universe. Look at the red supergiant. 
And this is the hypergiant. We think it's the largest of them all. Look at the sun and the earth. We should go into that to get, this is the compared size of the earth. And that's not the only objects. There are millions of similar stars, hyper mega star. And this star has a diameter of about 2.8 trillion kilometers. If we get the biggest commercial airplane and move around this, it will take us 900 years to go around its orbit. That's the size of the star. Well, this type of thing I bring to you because these things make me more curious. Wow, I have this problem. I have no cable. I couldn't get to, uh, um, I couldn't um, fetch the kids at school yesterday. That's not a problem. The universe is so full of wonders. I have a personal desire to explore what, what more is out there. So this leads me to a question. Is there life out there? According to statistics, according to them, in the universe there are 10, 10 million million galaxies. However, in each galaxy, we have about 10 billion stars. So in the universe, this number of stars, I don't know how to read it. And for each star, there are approximately 10 planets and 100 moons. And I was wondering, really, are we the only living beings in the universe? Apart from that, in the last 10 years, there are many theories saying, they will be checked in the forthcoming future, that in the solar system there are seven places where life could have existed or exists now. This, these are Mars and Pluto. We found an ocean. Did you know that? In a few days, they found, uh, uh, in the last few days, they found an ocean. In Saturn, the moons Europe, Ganymedes and Callisto, and in Jupiter, Titan and Enceladus. So, I, I was wondering, why do we talk about these things? What is in there for us? I put this cat there. Many people say, Elias, you know that curiosity killed the cat. And then what you do? And I like to quote this writer. In one of her characters, she says, curiosity killed the cat but satisfaction resurrected the cat. And this is how I feel. Why do I want to speak about these things? Why do I want to explore the universe? It gives me satisfaction, and that's all I need. I love to move beyond the frontiers. I want to see what's behind there. What is behind that frontier, beyond the sun, the moon, uh, other galaxies? Who knows? I'm a curious person. So get ready. I'll take you on a voyage for curious minds only. And we'll start with Arthur C. Clarke. You know him and his predictions. He said something that's very important. I saw him in a video. He said, if one person tries to predict the future and those around him are naive, know nothing about what's going on, and say, oh, yes, that does make sense. He says that it's prob highly likely that the prediction will be short in terms of the reality. However, he says, if for some reason someone in the future could come to the present disguised as one of us and starts telling us what's going to happen in 10, 100 years' time, we'll say he's crazy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And there are a few things that will literally sound off the wall to you. So how are we going to visit other stars? Well, the traditional way 
according to many scientists who say we are going to visit other stars. And we start with this. Wow, we have human beings in a star wars, in a aircraft journeying in the space. Many of the people who wrote these stories knew what I was talking about, but they did it nevertheless, because they knew that in a TV serial, like the one I'm going, makes it more interesting. People want to see human beings, spaceships, but those who created Star Trek do not believe in everything they do. Other people, however, say, well, maybe we can freeze human beings and send them there. And I will stop here. I will refer to Arthur C. Clarke again. Imagine that 200 years ago, I would ask someone, what do you think is going to be the future of transportation on land? They might have said, well, maybe we could feed horses better. Uh, or expect more of them, or maybe we could invent a machine and you start rolling and we add a hundred, we use a hundred horses and it will go faster. But if I told them, but in the future we will have aircraft and you will be able to go from A to B by flying, what will they say? You're crazy. What we are looking at now, freezing human beings and send them out, is like the horse concept. You take an idea and say, well, let's freeze people and send them out in space. And to me, this is wrong. This is really way out reality. Let's see what is impractical about this. I don't know how many of you have seen this type of picture. This is an astronaut in a space station. Look at him. Basically, he's training. Why? Because in space, your muscles are affected. So you need to do exercise, constant exercise. In my opinion, the astronaut up there is like having penguins in a desert or a camel in the Arctic, if I can get the picture. It's funny, isn't it? This is how they make ice cubes. This picture is also interesting. We don't pay much attention to this type of picture. This hole there was caused by dust, very tiny bit of dust that crossed the Endeavour transporter, causing a hole of six millimeters in and out. And I, um, or, and I started thinking, imagine I want to go to another star, I'm traveling in my aircraft, or spacecraft, and an object collides with my spacecraft. We all die. It's important to know that we are talking about extreme speeds. It's a fraction of the speed of light. A dust, a speck of dust, can really cause uh, an explosion and destroy the whole spacecraft. So how are we going to deal with that problem? Apart from that, astronauts need to be well protected with a special outfit with oxygen and a helmet. And this is because human beings have not evolved to live in the outer space. We have evolved to be here on Earth. And it's even difficult for us to live in the Arctic. We need to be well protected and we need a lot more in the outer space. This cannot happen. Uh, muscle atrophy is going to happen despite the fact that you do exercise every day. Some astronauts spend uh, more than a year in the outer space, but the senses are um, get atrophy. 
and this is all due to the fact that human beings, in terms of energy, we are too heavy compared to a satellite. We are very heavy. So we invest a lot of energy to raise our hands and also a lot of money. According to NASA, the Apollo missions would spend uh, $100,000 more than sending a satellite out in space because they need to provide things so that the astronauts would go on living. Finally, when we are out there, who knows what type of radiation we can meet. So we need to be protected. If we explore a new galaxy, who knows, a supernova may explode and we are destroyed. So my question is, what if, instead of exploring the cosmos, we evolve, just as we are, to what we call human 3.0. What do I mean by this? I think that a uh, human 1.0 is you and me now, today. 2.0 could be, well, an improved version. We have um, um, augmented reality lenses. You can interact with um, digital objects. You have some part which is bionic. And 3.0 would be this um, human that is going to be 100% synthetic, synthetic. We won't need a body. And before you leave the room, let me tell you something else. I believe that we will evolve, we will merge with the technology in this century before the year 2099. So the logical thing for me would be to send these humans out into space. Follow my line of thought, please bear with me. First of all, digital brains. Imagine I could remove my mind and put it into a chip. It requires less energy, occupies less space, and it could be sent to Mars or a supernova. And then the next question you will ask me, can an atomic construct, something I did outside my brain, really be aware and think? In other words, is it possible for science to create a machine that thinks as the human being does? Yes, is my answer, and I can demonstrate it. How? Very simply. You and you and you and all of us here literally, in the literally sense of the word, are machines. We are machines made up of atoms the atoms that we use to make microchips, but with the different configurations. So nature has given us uh, millions of examples of the fact that it is possible to make intelligent machines. I'm not saying that I know how to build them, but I'm saying it's possible. And it seems that we are going into that direction with deep learning. Another thing I want to clarify, human beings like to make a difference between artificial and natural things. For example, natural ju uh, orange juice. If I take an orange and I press it, this is natural juice. But if I go to a supermarket and I buy a powder, that's an artificial juice. However, when you analyze both, what are they composed of? Molecules. And the molecules are composed by atoms. So the term artificial is something that has been made up by us because it helps us express our ideas better. But everything is natural. Even the evolution, for example, the dogs that are bred and crossed with other breeds, well, all this is natural. The universe is experimenting, experimenting and we are the means in these intermediate steps. And that is why I say, and it's my opinion, that in this head there is a brain 
and also in a small device there may be something similar. It's a universe, we are atoms. Therefore, in my opinion, nature says that this is possible and it's going to happen in 30 years or so. And it's not me who says it. It's the director in artificial intelligence of Google and many who are in agreement with him. So, this is the uh, sensationalist part. I think that the way in which we will explore the galaxies is to send millions of human beings in small spheres in the approximate size of a tennis ball. And there you're going to tell me, stop, Elias. So what can I do with a tennis ball? Let's make here a parenthesis and let's look at the ultimate laptop. Seth Lloyd, who is extremely famous and a great scientist, in an article I had, uh, I was lucky to read, called The Ultimate Physical Limits to Computation, asked the following question. Is it possible to take one kilo of something, a sphere or a laptop, and know how many operations per second this machine can do or what information I can put inside. And thanks to Einstein, it's very easy to find out. Energy is, said Einstein, equal to the mass multiplied, as you see in the formula here on the screen. So you can transform energy in mass and mass in energy. And knowing this, he said, well, with one kilo of matter, this means that in, one, in a sphere of one kilo, you are storing 25 million megawatts per hour, which are equivalent to 72 continuous hours of energy of all the nuclear plants in the world generating energy. And this can fit in a little ball like this. And those who don't believe it, look at the videos of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where small things like this, unfortunately, caused those huge explosions. So if you manipulate further the equation, he reached this conclusion. In that space of one kilo, it is possible to execute 5.42 per 10 times 50 of operations per second, and this is no mistake, I copy pasted, and this device can be one million and million and million and million and million and million faster than an average laptop. And laptops were less powerful at that time, so I adapted this to 2017. And he says, how many atoms can fit in one kilo and how many information can you store there? And this is the size that he thought of, or 100 millions of millions of millions of time more space of uh, an average hard disk. For me, this was wow. So let's go back to the presentation. I, Jose Elias, I took this information, I did some research, and in the scientific literature, I started finding out how many bits are necessary to represent uh, in a digital way a human brain, taking into account the electrical load of all the neurons, etc. Things we don't know how to do, but we can uh, figure out. And here we have these figures that you would find in internet, eLife of 2015. For example, a human brain can be stored in approximately 8 per 10 and uh, multiplied by 15 bits. So how much information can fit there? And let us take an example from the children. Let's say that we have here 100 square meters, and I want to put 50 objects of one square meter each. No, if I have 
100 square meters. How many objects can I put in there? 100, because I divide the space per the size, and I find out how many fit. And the, I did the division from the previous page, and I calculated that this is the number of brains that would fit in one kilo of matter. And I cannot even read this figure, says the speaker. So this is just math. Math sometimes show you surprising things. But I divided this by the world population we have at the moment. And I said, how many planets would fit in this small sphere? So in a sphere of one kilo, I can put this number of times the whole population of the Earth. So people will tell me, but wait, this is just the storage. And how about processing? So I say, OK, I will give you 99% of the space in this sphere for processing and give me 1%. It means that this huge, in this huge figure, I just have to delete two zeros. And I still have billions of human beings that can fit in there. And someone may tell you, well, the brain of a human being goes much further. And I eliminate two more zeros. And we still have billions and billions of human beings that can fit in that sphere. This said, for those who are doubting, this is something that I presented here in GenExus a few years ago. And this is an IBM hard disk. Literally, they said it was a mobile hard disk because it could be moved with a little trolley. But it would take a lot of space in, up here. And those are five megabytes. Most of you are experts, but five megabytes, I will tell you, is an MP3, MP3 song. And the cost was $50,000 of the time. And in 2009, I updated the figure. And it was more than, it was almost $400,000. And if you go to Amazon, this would be a hard disk, two terabytes, which means that it has 2,000 megabytes, 400,000 more space than the one on the left. So think of it. These men on the left are carrying this huge disk. And a few years later, I have in my hand something that has 400,000 more space than the device on the left. And if I had told the guys on the plane that in a few years we would have the device that you see on the right in the palm of my hand, what would have they said? They would say, what have you been smoking? And that's why I say it, because I know that many of the things that I'm saying sound wow, but who knows? And I don't watch this on TV anyway. So having clarified that this is possible, at least in principle, theoretically, to put a big quantity of human beings is a small sphere, I say, OK, and how do we travel now? And Let's look at several options, practical things up to Im almost impossible things. But here I put a note, why not use rockets? And the famous rockets that even Musk is making, one rocket like that will use one millionth time of 1% of the energy available in the fuel it takes. Why? Because the chemical reactions used are ultra mega inefficient. In other words, what am I saying? In theory, that same rocket that Musk is using to go to the space would use the energy that has accumulated on the very small tip of a pin if we knew how to harness that energy.
then how can we prove this well with atom bombs? So the first possibility warms holes. Do you remember the movie of the guy who made Batman Interstellar? Well, according to some mathematical constructions, it would be possible maybe to bend the space in some way so that if I enter a black through a black hole here magically, I can exit on this side. Like in the image, you fold a piece of paper so as to make these two points coincide. But no scientists take this seriously. It's more like a mathematical game. If this worms holes existed, firstly, we would have to find them to see where they are. And secondly, I don't know where they will take us. So it's not very useful. And a ship that enters a hole and then is destroyed and becomes like a noodle or a string of the string theory is not very practical. Then quantic propulsion. And in my blog, you will see something curious if you want. Well, you know uh, Stephen Hawking, right? The scientist. I was going to put a picture and forgot. Well, I admire him a lot. I have one of his books here. Do you know why he became famous? Most people don't. Because of his study of black holes in nature constantly there are virtual particles and what are those right now between these two fingers or inside your body in space there is what we would call a quantic soup and there are virtual particles virtual particles that start to exist out of nothing, they clash and disappear. And that happens not trillions of time, but an unimaginable quantity of times right here between us. And this is not a theory it has been detected by labs. And then in a black hole, you know that the idea is that what when something enters a black hole, nothing can escape. I'm not going to uh, explain why, but that's a fact. So if this is a black hole, there is a point, a point around here, and if you are flying and you go to the other side, mathematically and practically, there's no way in which you can escape. You enter the black hole and disappear forever. But if the speed is fast enough, maybe you will just continue instead of entering the hole. And this is what we call the events horizon, and something that is well defined and that is uh, quite well known. And he became famous because he said, OK, so what would happen if in the events border there are two virtual particles, one on one side and the other one on the other side? And he said, OK, this means that they wouldn't be destroyed the one on this side will be entering the black hole and the other one will be expelled as a radiation. So the radiation will be coming out of nothing. And this is called Hawking's radiation. And that's why it became famous, because it was proved that he that this existed. So can we use this radiation maybe with a small black if you didn't know this, in this decade, we have created small laboratory black holes. Imagine one, and we use this effect of Hawking's radiation to um, propel it with the particles. That's the idea. You may not believe this, but a PhD student takes um, five years to understand this. I'm glad you got it. Now, something that is more practical that we can do today that has been tested in the Orion program in the US. What about having a spacecraft and then we drop an atomic bomb that explodes and this is like a propulsor? That's another idea. And there's yet a more exotic idea that you probably heard about matter, antimatter 
Well, the universe has more matter than antimatter, and we know a lot about that. And we know that if a particle uh, of matter, an atom, coll collides with its anti-atom, there is a very efficient conversion. It's like an explosion that's very efficient in terms of energy. So we could have a fuel tank with antimatter, another with matter, and we have them explode, and this is like a propelling thing. And then landing this a little bit more, we have ion engines. An ion, maybe you do not know what it is, but you probably know. You all know what an atom is. And an ion, when you were in high school, you probably learned that the atom has electrons and usually the same amount of electrons than protons. So what happens? The ion appears when there is a difference in quantity between the first and the latter. And science knows that if they can create ions living from a metal plaque with nothing mechanic, that will also have a propelling impulse. So this starts at a speed. You cannot see them moving. Uh, just a few atoms pushing, but in space there's no friction, so gradually, 24 hours later, they start increasing the speed, and in six months' time, they can go at the speed of light. And this works. It has been tested. Another way is to use solar, uh, like sailing uh, devices pushing you. In space, you can use the photons, the light coming from the sun, to really move the sails. And this has been tested also. Finally, this is suggested by Mr. Hawkins and other scientists. What about using something similar to a sail in the atmosphere near the moon or whatever, and uh, we have laser rays that are very powerful focusing on that sail. And we create the same effect in a much more concentrated way. According to the technology we have today, we can use this to send a spacecraft at 20% of the speed of light. So if we want to get to the star that is called uh, Centaurus, we can get there in 20 years. And then on the way back, it could send uh, visual information at the speed of light. So in 25 years, we will get to know what's happening out there. So what are we going to use out of all these options? Maybe a combination of them, or maybe the last three. But my message is how to make it possible. We have an idea of how to, I call them Elias spheres, but who knows. Now, if I send one of my spheres flying out in space, and then a speck of dust approaches, they collide, they explode, end of our trip. What was it meant for? I spent half an hour talking about nonsense. So, wait. What if we use two technologies to prevent that? Instead of sending out one spacecraft, we can send millions of them in the same direction. So we replicate mines across all the spaceships. We have RAID. You know what RAID is? These are hard disks. You can have five of them. If one is harmed, the information is not harmed. You can substitute it with another. So if you have 50 spaceships or a million and one has a problem, no problem. It, we can carry on. The intelligence is distributed among the rest. Now, what happens if in those millions of beings that you send out, one decides to become an evil hacker and wants to corrupt the data being exchanged across the spheres? He's a rebel. 
So we have a solution, a recent solution in Genexus, blockchain. With blockchain, uh, the transactions are um, worthwhile and you cannot change anything else. So what I am suggesting is to have a fleet of many, many spheres sent to the outer space with a redundant uh, capacity so that one substitutes the other and your mind is intact inside them. But the question is, well, let's imagine I want to go to the closest star, which is 4.1 um, light years. Well, that's far. However, that's the closest one. We see stars that are so far from us, a million light years or thousands of billions. So if I want to explore in that direction, what will I do during that time? It's going to be boring. It's going to be very, very, very boring. So I have a solution. This is my solution. First, it is important that we understand that according to Einstein, and this has been tested, our ticket, the fare we will buy to visit the outer space, is going to be a one-way ticket. Why? Because you probably saw Discovery Channel and the paradox of the twin brothers. There are two brothers. They are together. One goes to the outer space in a spaceship, and the other stays here. When the other come back, comes back, you know what happens. He, on Earth, is older, literally. And I'm not saying one month older. I'm saying 50 years older. And in practice, if you go to Centaur and come back, even though the one on Earth is 10 years, it's millions of years or 1,500 years. So that means that if you are going out to explore the universe, that's going to be a one-way trip. By the way you come back, you'll find something very, very different on Earth. So that's going to change. So responding to the question, what will we do during the trip? We'll do two things. One, a backup of the hard drive of your computer like uh, what Apple does with Time Machine. If you're working with your computer and something happens, you just look for the backup hard disk and continue. There are business solutions. You go to the server, you do a backup of the hard drive, and you make an image, and you can store it there. But not just store it. You can say, OK, I'm going to leave it for six months, and six months afterwards, I'll use a different server, and the whole machine will start uh, as from scratch. And in the future, given the scenario where our minds will become digital, nothing prevents me from doing plop, pause. So this is really cool. We'll go to Alpha Centaur, and five seconds later, I start sleeping pause, and when I'm getting there, when I see the stars, I wake up. And my perception is like I got there in two seconds. Do you get me? This is what's going to happen. And also people like me will want a robot to monitor me, and I will tell the robot, please, Every year, wake me up. I want to live a while. I want to look out of the window. In that case, uh, well, in that case, uh, there's going to be a virtual loss. With the computing power we'll have in the future, we can do things like that are much fun than Matrix, more educational, more fun, if you like, more fun than Matrix. You will be able to create worlds identical to this one, 
or world where you will fly or interact with your friends or go to the theater. So for a short time, I can live in that kind of atmosphere. So at the end of the day, uh, I will think that my whole trip only lasted 10 hours or two seconds to get to any point in the universe. And that will pose philosophical questions. Remember that uh, scene in Matrix when Cypher tells the people he's inside a Matrix. He says, oh, this beef here. I know it's not beef, but it looks like beef, tastes like beef, and it is beef to me. And that will be a question present. Some people will say, I will not like to live in that sort of world. They are imagining the sphere and not this that we have here. But I'm, I can guarantee that in the future, here on Earth, human beings will prefer to live in this type of world. Because this world sometimes hurts. I have to go from A to B, I need to walk. But there is a romantic side saying this is the cool thing about life. But other people will say, I don't like this. So there will be a difference. That's diversity. OK? Finally, once we get there, what are we going to do? What if I want to go out of my sphere and explore the new world? Well, that's why we have 3D printers with nanobot. And using the local material in the place, I can build myself a body. Well, I don't know. I'm thinking in an anthropomorphic way. I don't think I will want to create a human body. I want to move faster or do things faster. Maybe I will have tentacles like an octopus and feel the elements around me. I don't know. However, that's nothing. I would invite you to really take a step forward to what I call the intergalactic network. Wouldn't it be cool to just to have not just one group, but then be able to meet each other? And this is my inspiration, the circus. Have you seen this uh, cannon, fire cannon, with a man being shot into the air? What about shooting a man into the air and he gets here? What if we had a second cannon here and he's shot there? And there's a third cannon and you go uh, jumping from one place to another. We would generate something like a uh, subway. And here we'd have different destinations, a star, a meteorite, or whatever. So those who arrive first will build a port of light or whatever that will receive information from the other point and that will be transferred. Let me explain this more clearly. We would basically have, as we are information, imagine the hard disk example, we go as a sphere to that table, and you build something to catch the signals I'm sending from Earth. I get a hard disk, I fr freeze it, I'm used as information, and I'm transferred as an internet connection. I'm a ray of light, I'm being transferred. When I get here, the portal that receives me says, we are going to re build or activate your intelligence. And I live. And look at this. You don't need to wait for the spheres to start doing the process, because the distance is so long that I send spheres, and I already can calculate that after the spheres get here, it will take them a month to build the receiving uh, apparatus. So if I'm here, I send the spheres, and I just have to wait for one month. And with my transmitter, I send a laser beam. The laser beam comes with more people. We arrive here. They build this for a month while the ray, 
the beam of light comes here and they receive the people. And that can be replicated wherever we want to go. Did you understand my idea? I told you, this is fun. And this is teletransportation of minds intergalactically. <laughs> so, to sum up, believe it or not, everything I said could be summarized in one minute, but I had to tell you everything so that you believe at least part of what I'm telling you. So, look at the images from left to right top to bottom. Firstly, we have to become digital brains first. Then we send small spheres protecting ourselves with technology like ray or blockchain in the way we can pause our minds or live in virtual worlds. And then we are going to explore the world or create devices that can receive those who come to visit this uh, world, creating a system of special teletransportation. And my question is, E.T., could he right now cross our body with nutrients, which I don't know what it is, but I have an idea, and all the radiations that we see and the phenomena we cannot explain yet, and come in front of us and also millions and millions of beings and we don't know it because we don't have the technology to decode the signals and this makes me think too if we are the first ones though we have a bigger responsibility so i conclude by saying the people from the future bon voyage if they're here and if this interests you for those who download the presentation. These are many links that you can read where I talk about what I said here and it's also in my blog.